the Bible is often criticised as unreliable. We often hear that its message cannot be trusted. There is one group of men in particular that we can blame for this generally alleged unreliability of the Bible. And that group of men are known as the higher critics. And what I want to do with this afternoon is just to look at the work of the higher critics to <coughs> learn a little bit more about what they say or said and to understand that archaeology is just one way in which these men and women have been shown to be foolishly wrong. There are many ways in which the Bible can be shown to be reliable and true. And this afternoon I just want to look at one of those with you and to think about the damage that has been done in the popular mind by these men known as the higher critics. Now, the phrase higher critics might be new to you. You might have heard it and you might wonder, who are the higher critics? And what I want to do, just briefly, is to answer that question and to just review what the higher critics had to say for themselves so that we ourselves can be alive to their arguments whenever we come across them in whatever form they happen to come across to us so that we learn how to recognise them and beware of them and know that they can be answered. So why do we need to bother about them at all? <laughs> the first thing I think that has to be said about the higher critics is that they come in all shapes and sizes. They don't come up to you with a badge that says, I am a higher critic beware of me or don't believe what I say it's not like that they don't wear badges and very few if any of the higher critics in the world today actually call themselves higher critics they don't use that term in general but that doesn't mean they don't exist in fact these days they tend to call themselves much fancier terms than that they call themselves source critics but source as in O-U-R-C-E, not A-U-C-E. You understand what I mean? They call themselves form critics. Or they call themselves, even posher, redaction critics. But when you pick up and read a Bible commentary, almost any commentary published in the second half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century, it won't have a health warning on the cover that says, beware, this book was written by a redaction critic or a form critic or a source critic. Or when you hear a TV announcer, or when you read a so-called expert writing something about the Bible, they won't tell you up front that their approach to the Bible is a higher critical one. They won't do that. They just take it for granted. That that's normal. And yet if we are going to read our Bibles objectively, if we are going to give God a chance to speak to us openly through the pages of this book, then we need to be on our guard against a hypercritical approach and we need to be able to recognise these critics in all their different forms. And to do that, we need to be able to recognise their arguments against a divinely inspired Bible. We need to be sure that there is always an answer to them. So what is this, this so-called higher criticism? Where did it come from? And what should we know about it? Bit of history to start with. The term higher criticism was first used to identify a particular school of negative biblical criticism that arose in the theology department of the University of Tübingen in Germany during the first half of the 19th century. So it's been around a long time. I'll say more about Tübingen in a moment when I start naming some names. But for the moment, I just want to paint a broad brush picture of higher criticism. Because in fact, during the second half of the 19th century, as the pernicious influence of the Tübingen School of Theology began to spread, the term higher criticism came gradually to describe all the different types of biblical criticism that treat the Bible as a work of purely human origin and sad to say 
That same view of the Bible still pervades both the scholarly and the popular approach to the reading and understanding of the Bible in our day. To the point where, this is where we're at now, where belief in the inspiration of the Bible as the word of God has become very unfashionable indeed, to say the least. So why do we need to know, if it isn't already obvious? The main reason why we need to know about the higher crit critics is because they have been largely responsible for undermining and almost entirely eliminating general public confidence and belief in the Bible as the word of God. It's vital, therefore, if we are going to approach the Bible with an open mind, that we should know about these Bible critics and their methods. Because unless faith in the Bible is going to be like the faith of an ostrich, I'm not even sure an ostrich has faith, but you know what I mean, if it's going to be blind, unreasoning, without any evidence, unless that's the kind of faith we're going to have, then we owe it to ourselves to find out whether what these high critics have said and the people who follow them have said is or is not true. And it can actually, when you find answers to these problems, it can actually help to bolster your faith to know that the Bible really is the word of God and that the higher critics can be shown to be wrong. In fact, I would go as far as to say that it, it may be because Bible believers don't generally know enough about the mistakes that the higher critics have made in the past and are still making and because by and large these critics don't get tackled often enough and vigorously enough that their, their conclusions have made such direct inroads into the public <coughs> consciousness and have actually overthrown the faith of so many. The situation that we're in now has been described by Charles Marston as what I call a sad state of affairs and he says this the complete assurance with which many higher critics wrote has been entirely unjustified. Yet the mass of people have thought that the higher criticism, since it was endorsed and advocated even by distinguished bishops, could be taken for granted as giving correct results. The effect of such grave errors upon Christianity in general has been devastating. That's the position I think that we're in. So who are or who were the original higher critics. And I just want to give you a little bit more history here. I'll go through these as quickly as I can. I just want to show you some of the names and pictures where they're available of these higher critics. This is Ferdinand Bauer. And it was Ferdinand Bauer who tried to prove, and I put that in inverted commas deliberately, he tried to prove that Paul did not write the pastoral <coughs> epistles, the letters to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Come back to him in a little bit. This is another one of the higher critics, Julius Wellhausen. He was responsible for the documentary hypothesis, as it's called, which speaks about the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, as if they were written by all sorts of different people, and that what we have now is in fact a cobbling together of a number of different texts written at different times. He was responsible for that documentary hypothesis. And he also went so far as to say that Moses could not write, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Another one, Friedrich de Litch. He wrote a controversial book called Babel and Bible, published in 1902, in which he set out to prove that the Genesis account was borrowed directly, those are his words, written in German but translated, directly from Babylonian culture during the 6th century Israelitish captivity in Babylon. And his writings frequently attacked the Old Testament for its so-called inaccuracies. Then there was a man called Heinrich Ewald. He's the scholar who found what he said were convincing linguistic reasons for assigning the book of Daniel to the post-exilic Maccabean era that is about 400 years after the time that Daniel will have lived in. <coughs> there were many others too from the same period of German academic scholarship, most of them influenced by the School of Theology at Tübingen, who all added something to the mass of higher critical material that was literally pouring out of Germany in the 19th century. Sad to say, these critical German scholars had also a group of British scholars who swallowed most of their teaching. 
especially among the university-educated clergymen who wanted to make a display of their advanced learning by adopting and spreading what were by then fashionable ideas of the German schools of theology and criticism. And so among those in England who accepted the high critical views was this man, the Dean of Westminster. He wasn't the only high churchman, but he probably was the one who embraced more of these liberal ideas than anyone else in the 19th century. And he certainly did more than any other single man of the cloth in England to undermine a simple faith in the word of God. Dean Stanley sprang to the defence of this man, who was treated as a heretic even by his own church, the Church of England, the Bishop John Colenso. For those of you who are old enough to remember in the 20th century, the Bishop of Woolwich, <coughs> you'll know what I mean when I say John Colenso was the Bishop of Woolwich of the 19th century. And he embraced higher critical views, especially about the writings of Moses. And then along came this man, Canon Driver, in many ways, Driver was even more negative. He was even more effective in his spreading of the higher criticism. He was an Oxford professor of Hebrew. He swallowed higher critical theories wholesale, but then he passed them on systematically to a whole new generation of Oxford scholars, younger scholars who sat at his feet in Oxford and then went away and spread them into the wider world. Driver also edited the Cambridge Bible Commentary and the Clarendon Bible series, and that fact makes many of those widely circulated volumes seriously flawed from a point of view of a Bible believer. And the theory for which Canon Driver is perhaps most well known is the divided Isaiah theory, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. In the academic world, the acceptance of higher critical theories and methods became almost a test of your scholarship and of your orthodoxy. There was no room for any dissent. If you were going to have a career, you had to accept the higher critical theories. You didn't get a job if you didn't accept them. It's what I call the emperor's clothes, <coughs> story, where everybody knows that the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, but doesn't admit it until a little boy comes along and says, look, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. It's a widespread assumption that everybody accepts, even though it isn't the case. It's like an urban myth. The urban myth is that the Bible is unreliable, but it just is not true. And you have to see through the higher critical ideas to really understand that the Bible is the word of God. But before we look at some of the ways in which these higher critical theories about the Bible are shown to be wrong by the evidence of archaeology, I just want to say a few more words about just what higher criticism is, why it's called higher, and what particular areas of Bible study it affects or has to deal with. It's perhaps an obvious thing to say, but it is true that the use of the term higher presupposes that there is a word, a, a lower criticism criticism for which the word lower is used. And here's a dictionary definition that you might find helpful. It comes from Chambers' Encyclopedia. The term higher criticism has reference not to any pretended superiority. It is concerned with questions of date and the authorship, unity and literary structure, <coughs> the sources used and the historical media reflected in the books of the Bible. The lower criticism is concerned with the history of the text after it left the hands of the author or compiler and seeks to recover the original form of the text. In other words, the lower criticism concerns itself with identifying any area, errors of copying, errors of transmission as they're called, things which may have crept into the text since it was first written down. That's the work of linguists and paleographers. And there is generally little to be afraid of in respect of their work, because their criticism very rarely challenges faith in the Bible's reliability. The higher criticism, on the other hand, really does set out to make categorical statements about things which impact directly on many basic beliefs about the Bible. Issues of authorship, of meaning, of authenticity, of accuracy and of reliability. So that's why higher critical theories are so dangerous. And the higher critics 
approach their task from two basic points of view, illustrated on the chart. It shows us what we might call the family tree of biblical criticism. The lower criticism relates, as I've said, to textual matters. The higher criticism is basically divided into two further types of criticism, literary and historical. And to illustrate this, I'm only going to talk about higher criticism here, literary and historical, and just to illustrate these particular areas, I've chosen a, a typical sample of five cases where the higher critics have been shown to be completely wrong in their confident assertions about the Bible, and shown, shown to be wrong by the evidence of archaeology. So I want to take three of them under the heading of literary criticism, and two of them under the heading of historical criticism. And in all these cases, we have to see how very clearly the higher critics have been dishonest and wrong in their destructive approach to the Bible. So here they are, set out against this original diagram. First of all, I want to look at the question of the authorship of the Pentateuch, whether or not it was written by Moses, whether or not Moses could write, as one of these higher critics said he couldn't. Secondly, I want to look at the dating of Daniel. Was it written in the time when Daniel would have lived? Or was it written 400 years later, when the prophecies in the book would just actually have been history, and not prophecy as they claim to be? Thirdly, I want to look at the authorship of Isaiah's prophecy. Was it written by one Isaiah or two? Or perhaps even more? And then in the historical category, we look at what the higher critics said about Genesis chapter 14, which was a, a particularly popular, well-loved chapter for the critics to attack. We'll see why. And then finally, we'll look at a few of what the higher <coughs> critics have claimed were legendary accounts in the Bible. Things, people, places that never existed and that the writers simply made up. First of all then, let's take the question of the authorship of the Pentateuch. It was Julius Wellhausen who boldly stated in the 1870s that the first few books of the Bible could not possibly have been written by Moses because he lived at a primitive era of human history when writing was, in inverted commas, unknown. And that was the claim of the experts then. Actually, that gives us a useful insight into the high critical method because wherever possible they will argue from silence and that is an argument from silence the evidence wasn't available to show that Moses could or couldn't write so let's assume that Moses couldn't write that's a higher critical approach and at the time when Wellhausen made that claim there was no archaeological evidence available in fact the earliest archaeology was from the classical Greek period around 800 BC and Wellhausen's influence across Europe at that time was such that when the editor of the Encyclopaedia Britannica came to write the entry about the Bible, a very big entry, <coughs> in the ninth edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica in 1881, he included Wellhausen's theory in the Encyclopaedia as if it were the most well-established fact of history. So that if you did, as I have done, and took down a copy of the 1881 Encyclopedia Britannica, the fount of all wisdom, at that time, and you read in that book, you would see Moses couldn't have written the first five books of the Bible because he couldn't write. And that was then the accepted wisdom of the world. Doesn't it appear very providential then that at that very period, in the late 1800s, Oriental archaeology was being put on a much more scientific basis than hitherto, particularly through the work of the Palestine Exploration Fund <coughs> and the Egypt Exploration Society. There were a lot more professional archaeologists beginning to work on properly funded official excavations, and a lot more evidence was coming out of the earth. And it was thanks to the work of these professional archaeologists building on the slightly earlier discoveries of anthropologists and explorers like Rawlinson and Layard, it was thanks to their work that the date of the invention of the writing was put back to at least 3000 BC, and possibly even earlier. And this new knowledge was based on materials like these. 
This is a Sumerian clay tablet dating from around 2600 BC and predating Abraham by at least six centuries. Never mind Moses talking about Abraham. This is a cuneiform tablet from a vast library dating from around 2500 BC. This is a tablet from the Tel El Amarna archive of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten and it dates from the second millennium BC, quite close in time in fact, to the time of Moses. Oh, but Moses couldn't write. Yes, he could. Now, to their credit, there were some biblical scholars who refused to wear the emperor's new clothes and who did begin to accept the growing volume of archaeological evidence that supported an early date for the invention of writing. But quite perversely, some German scholars and many English higher critics continued to think that Wellhausen was basically correct in his hypothesis that Moses could not have written the first five books of the Bible. Talk about ignoring the evidence. But Wellhausen's theory, this documentary hypothesis, which made up the idea without anything other than subjective evidence, that the books of the Pentateuch consisted of four or possibly five different texts written at different times by different people, possibly none of them by Moses, that was Wellhausen's claim, that it became part and parcel of the received wisdom of the scholarship about the Old Testament, and yet it is an unproved and an unprovable hypothesis, even though most people take it for granted as true, even though it isn't. There's a lesson in there somewhere, isn't there? The second example, an idea again that has been discredited, concerns the dating of Daniel, and it's a critical attack that was first made by Heinrich Ewald. Ewald based his later dating of Daniel on, excuse me, on Daniel's use of certain Greek-sounding words for musical instruments. You know, the, the chapters where there are all the musical instruments that are mentioned uh, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And all those words have, have a, a distinctly Greek feel to them. And Eval claimed this as evidence of a post-exilic date. I'll show you the, um, the list. You recognise them from the, the words on the right-hand side. The words on the left are the words in the original. And I suppose when you think about it, that the book of Daniel was bound to come in for critical attacks from people who don't believe in God, because it contains many <coughs> detailed prophecies about things that were then future. So if you're going to discredit the book, then you're going to say it was written much later, when those things weren't future but were in the past, so very easy to write about so this is the list of the Greek terms that Ewald said proved that the book of Daniel couldn't have been written <coughs> until the time of the Maccabees, when the influence of Greece was said to be at its height in the Middle East, that is about 400 years after the time of the biblical Daniel. But what exactly does archaeology tell us now about the true facts of this particular case? Well, first, we learn from inscriptions and carvings like this one, which was found in Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh, unearthed during the 19th century, that there was, in fact, cultural contact between the Middle East and Greece as early as the 8th century BC. Sennacherib, in fact, conquered a Greek army early in his reign. And Greek merchants are now known to have traded with the Fertile Crescent as early as the 6th century BC, when Daniel, the biblical Daniel, was in Babylon. So the existence of words for musical instruments showing Greek influences in the book of Daniel is actually an evidence of its genuineness, rather than being an evidence of its later composition. In fact, subsequent archaeological and linguistic discoveries have shown that a number of the words that Daniel used for particular musical instruments had actually changed or fallen out of use by the later date when Ewald claimed that Daniel was written. So the higher critic got it completely wrong, <coughs> and the evidence is in favour of an early date. Instructive, isn't it? 
Our third example of a direct attack on the scriptures by the higher critics is this issue of the authorship of the prophecy of Isaiah. Taking his cue from Wellhausen, the man, the editor of the, of the Encyclopedia Britannica, who mistakenly wrote that Moses couldn't write, he also claimed in 1882 that the book of Isaiah was actually the work of two different writers who lived at least 400 years apart. This was the so-called Deutero-Isaiah theory, second Isaiah, and it was eagerly swallowed and developed by many subsequent biblical scholars, including Canon Driver. He included it in his book, The Life and Times of Isaiah. The funny thing is, though, that whereas Smith, who originated the idea, thought that the break in the book between the two different writers came at the end of chapter 39, no, Smith thought it came at the end of chapter 33, I'm sorry. Driver argued that it came at the end of chapter 39. There's a career to be made in proving exactly where this break supposedly came. There are some biblical scholars today who think that Isaiah may have had three authors. There are some even now who have rediscovered, in inverted commas, the single authorship of the book. But what does archaeology have to say about this, if anything? Well, some of you will recognise where this is, because to start with, among the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the Qumran Caves in the late 1940s, there are no fewer than 19 copies of the Book of Isaiah. Two of them are complete, and both of those copies show the Book of Isaiah in an undivided, in an undivided state from chapters 1 to 66, just as we have it in our own Bibles now. And these are very ancient texts. This one, known as the Great, I <coughs> excuse me, the Great Isaiah Scroll, has been dated fairly <coughs> accurately to shortly after 200 BC. In other words, this is a copy made a few hundred years after the time when the prophet Isaiah lived. But it's all in one piece. It has no breaks, no distinctions between chapters 33 and 34, or between chapters 39 and 40, or anywhere else for that matter, such as you might have expected to find if there'd been two different authors or three different authors, and if Isaiah had been written over a period of 600 years. But there's even more to it than that amazing discovery, because an honest and objective appraisal of the language of Isaiah chapters 40 to 66, which is supposed to be the second Isaiah, shows that there are no Hebrew words no phrases, no constructions used in any of those later chapters of the book that are later in date than any of those used in chapters 1 to 39. They're all consistent with an 8th century date of writing. You have to take a subjective view of them to think otherwise. And the so-called change of style between the two sections is in any case based entirely upon opinion. Changes of style, after all, are found in most documents of any length. They usually occur when the writer is dealing with different subject matter. That's what you find throughout Isaiah. Sometimes you find songs, sometimes you find prophecy, sometimes you find <coughs> narrative, sometimes you find quiet introspection. You can find similar changes of style in Shakespeare's plays. But that doesn't prove there were two or three or perhaps even more William Shakespeare's and that they've all been sewn together at a later date. So the higher critics have built a house of cards with arguments that stand on very flimsy ground. So after those three examples of literary higher criticism, let's look at just two examples from historical higher criticism. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 14. It was a chapter that the higher critics loved to attack in the 19th century. It contains an account of Abram's conflict with four kings from the east of Canaan. And it was attacked by the higher critics as one of the most unhistorical and inaccurate parts of scripture. The kings mentioned in the opening verses of Genesis 14 were said not to have existed. Their raids were said to have been impossible. And the record mentions places with the, which the critics rejected as the figment of the writer's imagination. I'm actually quoting there from the books that they wrote about this issue. Actually, this is, this is what 
Wellhausen wrote that four kings from the Persian Gulf made an incursion into the Sinaitic Peninsula, that they attacked five kinglets on the Dead Sea shore and carried off prisoners, and finally that Abram set out in pursuit with only 318 manservants and forced them to disgorge their prey, which is what Genesis 14 says, all these incidents are sheer impossibilities. That's what a respected scholar in the 19th century said. But Wellhausen wrote all that biased criticism before the discovery of ancient records relating to Hammurabi or Amrafel, including this fragment from 1950 BC, in which the name of Kedaleoma, who is one of the kings mentioned in Genesis 14, where it appears in its Elamite form of Kudur Lagama, illustrated there by the arrow. It's as a result of inscriptions like this that our knowledge of the culture and the civilization around the time of Abraham has been completely revolutionized. So much so that no self-respecting scholar would ever now repeat what Wellhausen said about Genesis 14. In fact, the scholars of today <coughs> are more likely to agree with the following statement in support of the historicity of Genesis 14. Words of D.J. Wiseman. In Genesis 14, Abram is described in terms which accord with the early second millennium. For example, the Genesis 14 incident would hardly have been feasible after 1000 BC. There is nothing inconsistent in the Abrahamic narratives which demands that this is a late interpretation of the patriarch's role. And it's not just Genesis 14 either that's now recognised as generally historical, because the same applies to most of Genesis chapters 12 to 50, as J.A. Thompson has written. The fact that there are so many links in the Genesis narratives with the world of the first part of the second millennium BC is inexplicable if the stories of the patriarchs are only the inventions of later days. We are compelled to conclude that the narratives of Genesis 12 to 50 have a solid historical basis. A high critic could not have written those words. But here's another example, a last example in fact, of attacks made by the historical higher critics. Here they've accused Bible accounts of being mythical. They said that the existence of Sargon was made up. The murder of his son Sacharib, Sennacherib, related in Isaiah 34, <coughs> and even the fall of Babylon under Belshazzar, all those Bible accounts were once said to be legendary. Yet solid archaeological evidence has been unearthed for every one of these, and for literally hundreds more. Here, for example, is a magnificent carved head of Sargon, together with a relief portrait, both found in the ruins of Nineveh, and proving, beyond any doubt, that Sargon was a very real, and certainly not a mythical, 8th century ruler of Assyria. Nobody now doubts Sargon's existence, nor that he was the father of Sennacherib, and so the higher critics have been proved wrong yet again. As far as Sargon's son Sennacherib himself was concerned, the archaeologists have found this ancient inscription about his death. On the 20th day of Tebet, his sons revolted against him and they killed their father Sennacherib. On the 18th day of Sivan, Esarhaddon, his son, became king. Which is exactly what the Bible said in the first place. And here's a text of an inscription found at Ur, dating from the time of Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus. It takes the form of an invocation to the Babylonian gods. This is what Nabonidus prayed to his god for his son, Belshazzar. <coughs> may it be that I, Nabonidus, king of Babylon, never fail you, and may my firstborn, Belshazzar, worship you with all his heart. So, as far as the historicity of Belshazzar is concerned, he is now a well-attested historical ruler of Babylon, whose short reign of two or three years ended in the disaster of the fall of Babylon to the Medo-Persians. So, what kind of conclusion can we draw from all this? Well, perhaps the only good thing that we can say about the higher critical attacks on the Bible is that they have served to illustrate human ignorance. 
Also, perhaps, that they've been a means of helping at least some Bible readers to appreciate and value God's Word more highly. It has, after all, made Bible readers take a closer and more intelligent look at the text of Scripture and at the evidence that lies buried in the earth. My final thought comes from the lips of Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 5. For as we think about the Bible and the higher critics, I believe that these words of Jesus should act as a bolster to faith in the word of God, and particularly in that most maligned part of the scriptures, the books of Moses. If you believed Moses, Jesus said, you would believe me, for he wrote of me, no doubt in the mind of Jesus Christ. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? It's a direct personal challenge, isn't it, to anyone who doubts the authenticity of the writings of Moses. But I leave you with this reassuring quote from a book called Archaeology Gives Evidence by Rendell Short. The trend of all this increased knowledge from archaeology has been to confirm the authority of the books of the Old Testament. Destructive criticism is thrown on the defensive, and the plain man may read his Bible confident that for anything that modern research has to say, the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen to that.